Hi there and a very warm welcome to this week's video in which we are going to get creative. Well, we are going to get creative in other videos too, but this time we are going to get creative with motion blur. As I've seen a lot of videos lately dealing with this ethereal motion blur style, so I dove into that and figured out a way to do that and this is what this tutorial is about. So without further ado, let's grab your coffee as always and let's keep going. Also, as always, let's have a look what we are going to do today. Small disclaimer, we are not making this whole scene. We are talking about the concept that enables you to make such scenes. But if you're interested how I did that, you can download the scene files from this video from my Patreon. The link is down in the description below. And welcome to 3D land. Now, the actual concept is quite simple to understand if you know motion blur. So with this scene, I opted for a setup to teach you all the important bits. To create motion blur in the first place, we are going to need an object that is moving. So let's create a cube here and make it a little bit more small, like 10 by 10 centimeters. In Octane, a key ingredient for motion blur is the Octane object tag, so let's give it one. And usually when you do that, the motion blur is already enabled here. Also, you have to have a camera in your scene with enabled motion blur, so let's go to the motion blur tab and enable it. You can see the shutter time is zero, which means no motion blur at all. What I usually do, at least for animations, is go to the shutter angle and leave it at 180. This is basically the standard for moving images, so most of Hollywood movies, for example, are shot with this principle, which pretty much means if your object is moving from A to B within one frame, you are getting half of the movement through the blur, and 360 would be the whole movement in one frame. Speaking of movement, let's add some movement. So let's go to the cube and put it to minus 15 and make a keyframe here. Then maybe move it to frame 4 and then make a keyframe on the other side. Here we go. Now to see this range here better, let's hit Ctrl D and make the range from frame 0 to 10. Let's put the checker texture on the cube so we can see better if it's moving. And then actually step through the keyframes and you can see we now have motion blur. A uh, word of caution here, the Octane Live Viewer likes to go forward, so if you go backwards, sometimes the motion blur is broken and is not displayed correctly. Let me introduce you to another thing that becomes important with our concept. So let's go to frame 2, hit our cube, then go up on the y-axis by 20 and make another keyframe. Now if we step through the animation, there are actually two things to take note of. First, the motion blur always goes from the previous frame to the current frame, so the cube is on top and the motion blur ends at the top position. And also, if we move further, you can see it's always linear. And as you might have expected, of course, there are settings for that, and those are to be found in the camera tag under motion blur and alignment. As you can see, it's set to before, but it needs to be set to centered in order to get a centered motion blur. Now, if it shrinks down by half, as you just saw here, you can just reload the scene. And to show that it's working, let's go to the middle position and reload again. And now you can see it's centered, but it's still linear. And this is where time sampling per frame comes into the equation. You can find that in the render settings under Octane and in the main tab, there it is. And it goes from 1 which means linear interpolation to a whopping 32. Let's set it to 8 for now, go out of there and then move through the animation again. And what is this? It's not working. And yes, this is unfortunately a limitation of the live viewer, which only can display the linear type of motion blur. So in order to see what we are doing, we need to render into the picture viewer. So let's go to the point where the curve is changing and then render here. And here we can see now we have a curve. Let's actually go a little bit more in depth into the concept territory. To get this ethereal look, we basically have to blur the object without moving it. So my concept is to move the object along its path every frame. 
But even if we put the keyframes here bumper by bumper, we still need one, two, three frames to repeat one cycle. So what we actually need to do is go into subframe territory. What I like about it is that it sounds something like out of a movie. Captain, it appears we have to go into subframe territory. I don't like it. All sorts of weird things are happening there. But we seem to have no other choice. As you might notice, I'm not a voice actor. That's the best I can do. But back to topic, to get into subframe territory, we need to open the dope sheet or F curve. So let's go with the dope sheet here. Let's zoom in by hitting H. Now still, if I try to move a keyframe, it will snap to whole frames. So we need to turn off the snapping. Fortunately, there's a setting for that under edit and here is enable frame snapping or just hit X. So now the movement is fluid and unsnappy. Since we emphasized the center of the frame before by our alignment option for the motion blur, we want to keep the highest point on the full frame. So what this means is that we would start at 0.5, then the center is at the full frame, which means one, and then we end at 1.5. So we can start the cycle for frame two again. Now, if we go to frame one and render, we can see, yes, it's working. This right now, of course, only goes for frame one. So if we move to frame two, for example, and render that, then we can see nothing. Here we go. And copying over keyframes through the whole range is a bit tedious. So fortunately, there's a thing that makes our lives a lot more easy. For this, let's move into the timeline here. It also works in the dope sheet, but you can see it better here. So if we select all those sequences, you can see we have a before and after, and it's set to constant. But we can set it to repeat, and now it does the same thing for every frame. Isn't that nice? Before actually jumping into the more advanced bottle scene, let's bring up the picture view once more and move to our blur render to point out some things. First of all, I think we need higher substeps, as the substeps can be clearly seen here. Second of all, if we compare it to our bottle render, in the middle, the bottle was visible while the motion blur faded off to both sides. And this is just one continuous blur here. And third, there's no artistic control. The blur would stay the same throughout our timeline. So let's check out how I solve those problems with the bottle scene. Welcome to our bottle scene or flask scene as I call it here. The first problem is not a problem anyway, because we already know where to change the subframes. If you have forgotten, just go to the render settings and then time samplings per frame, and let's maybe up them to 20. Now to something more challenging, the next thing I noted in the cube scene was that our subframe animation was the same throughout our whole timeline here. To make this more art directable, I needed something more than just repeating keyframes every single frame. So my solution was, instead of using keyframes to move the flask itself, let's use a spline and move the flask along the spline. So in every frame we move from 0 to 100%, and as we change the spline, we also change the movement. So let's set up something like this, by going to the start angle minus 180, and then 0, and then go to the flask, right click, animation tags, and then align to spline drag in our spline here. And now we have a percentage where we can move our flask along. And this is exactly where I want to put my subframe animation. As we already did that before, I'm going to speed through this real quick. Now, if we real quick go to frame one and render, you can see that it will follow the spline perfectly. Here we go. Very nice. And actually it's time to tackle our next problem, which is the emphasis on the middle here, so we can actually see the bottle with the fading off motion blur to both sides. So if we close the window for now and go back to our keyframes, if we move along in our time within one subframe, you can see that the bottle is pretty much taking the same time in every spot of our spline. If you know long exposure photography, you know that if your camera stands still, everything else that stands still will be sharp, whereas moving objects will be blurred. 
We can take that to our advantage and take a fraction of our frame and also let the bottle stand still here. So at the full frame we create a portion where the bottle stands still and it should be really that simple. So 0.95 to 1.05. Here we go. Let's also remove the easing from our start and end point. To do that we roll out the tangent, deselect auto tangents and set all of this to zero. Here we go. Now if we render again, we can see that exactly results in the desired look. Obviously you can play around with that curve and create the look you desire. Now to round this off we can add a little bit more complexity to it by for example creating a moving target for our flask to orient towards. We can do so by duplicating the arc, call it arc2, then go into the arc settings and go for 180 to 0 and the set y axis, create one null and duplicate that, call one of them target, the other one up. Now we need to copy the align to spline tag to the target and exchange the spline to the arc2. Then right click on the flask here and create a target and feed it with the target null. To see what we are actually doing we cannot step through our timeline here since this doesn't support subframes. So let's go to our dupe sheet again and here we can see what we are doing. It's not quite there yet. So what we actually want to do is rotate our flask on the P angle by minus 90. So it looks at our target. Let's go and see that. Here we go. We can also see it's flipping whenever it passes the middle. This is also not what we want. This is why we created the up vector. So in our target, let's link the up vector in here and let's actually move it by 50 on the set axis. And now if we are moving, the animation is complete. Let's go out of the camera for a second so you have a better idea what we are looking at. So we have a two-way animation now that can be adjusted for example by adjusting the length of one spline here. And all these spline position and values can of course be animated over time. So let's go back inside of our camera and now our object is slightly out of frame. So let's go to our camera now and adjust that and then render one more time. Here we go, we have a much more complex looking motion blur now. The really cool thing with this technique is that it doesn't destroy camera movement, so you still have normal motion blur for all the other objects in your scene. And before we go to the bonus section, yes there is one again. This is basically it for the main attraction. Now make it your own with your own lighting, your own objects, your own ideas. I can't wait to see what you come up with. Alright, welcome to our bonus scene and if you were going, the bubbles, what about the bubbles? This is exactly what we are going to do. So let's create a bubble, basically it's just a sphere. So let's go to sphere, make sure it is at hexahedron as this gives a very regular mesh, as you can see here. I deformed those spheres a little bit in my master file, so this is necessary there, but for now we are going to leave that out. Alrighty, let's create a material by going to a specular material, call it bubble, and then go to the transmission, set it to one. After that we go to common, set the fake shadows option to on, and also film wall. Then we assign it and this already looks like a soap bubble. To get the coloring, let's go to the material nodes, then bring in a octane noise and go with a projection that we can set to XYZ to UVW that we then need to plug into the film with. Here we go, we have our colors now. To duplicate our bubble, I used a cloner. So let's do the same here. Cloner, move the bubble in here. And we have sort of a array of bubbles. Let's move them up a little bit. Here we go. Now the next couple of steps are just a succession of random effectors. So let's have the clone selected, go to MoGraph and then effectors and then go to random. But for now, instead of a random position, we want a random scale, actually with uniform and absolute and go with a value of minus 0.5 here. Here we go. Next, let's select the cloner again and then again MoGraph and random effector. 
This time we want to randomize the rotation actually and let's go for a 45 degree angle. We don't see that in our bubbles since they're round. This is going to take effect later on. And last but not least, the same yet again, MoGraph random effector. And there we have the position, which we want this time. Now you might ask, what is up with the rotation? And I can answer you that. So let's go to the effector and change the strength. And you can see that we sort of make circular movements here. And the circles become bigger the further we are away from the center. So if we go 15 here, then go back to the position and change that, you can see those circular movements. And basically all I have in mind is that a circular movement is looking more organic and less like CG when it comes to motion blur. Now it's time to dive into subframe land again. To not bore you with the same repetitive process, we can go to our other scene and just copy the track here and then put it into our cloners. For example, in the strength, here we go, paste track in the position as well as in the rotation. Now, if we go to our dope sheet again, I always wondered why it's named like this. What doesn't carry over is the repetition. So we have to set this real quick. Repeat, repeat. Then we are there. So we have our repeating bubbles. Last but not least, what we have to do is go for extensions and get a octane object tag on there. And then we can render and marvel at our nicely motion blurred bubbles. And this is it. I hope you liked the tutorial or tutorials if you count the bonus as an extra one. This week I actually have no clue how popular this will be. I have the feeling it either is vastly successful or it tanks completely. Fingers crossed for the first option. If you make something cool with this technique, I really would love to see it. Add me, for example, on Twitter or Instagram. And now, as always, without further ado, let's thank those people who made this video possible, my Patreons. Especially my 50 Euro tier subscribers, Chiels Augustinen, Just a Freakin, and Leon Studio TV. Also, of course, a huge thank you for my 15 Euro tier subscribers, for the Thieves, Render King, Alessandro Bonchio, Alessio De Vecchi, BVR, Chris Fritschi, Christian Grajewski, Erbe Plus Academy, George Luna, Graham Bagnell, James Conkel, Joel Mackimer, John Edward, Muratan Axos, Nico Straub, Part 1 of 2, Quok an Dang, Ralf, Random Capibara, Raiko, Renato Marquez, Reshock, Shamos Johnson, Shiro2049, Terry Wayne Ranson, and Yasin Rupp. Thank you all so very much for making it possible to produce those videos that you all enjoy. What is this? A halfway decently timed video? Don't ask me, I'm surprised myself. I have imagined this longer in my head than it actually took. Nice surprise to have it the other way around every once in a while. I'm really looking forward to the feedback on this one. For now, I don't have an idea for next week's tutorial, so please find me and hit me with ideas. As always, if you want to show your support against the algorithm overlords and for me, Let's post a stopwatch in the comments down below. And that should be it for now. Thank you very much for watching, for staying with me that long. A fantastic start into next week, or simply a great time if you're watching this later. And I say, don't get lost in the subframe space.